In the United States, there is a group of culturally influential people who enjoy wagging their fingers at the rest of us about the moral demands that we ought to follow. We are often told by this group the proper ways to think, to vote, to behave, what we should watch, who we should admire, and who we should scorn. And yet, embedded in this moral paternalism are a lot of paradoxes. For example, we are told to believe women, but there's also no such thing as a woman. America is systemically racist, but non-white immigrants should come here. Today, I have a list of over 10 of these examples of doublethink. We're going to explore them one by one. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Hey everyone, welcome to Timeless. It is great as always to be with you. I love doing this show. Just a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below so that you can stay notified with every new piece of content that I post. As a reminder, in addition to Timeless, we also have Dennis and Julie every Monday on this channel. It airs at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. If you do follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman, you will know that recently I posted a list of about nine examples of contradictions that exist in our society. You heard two of them in the introduction, and you'll hear the remaining seven plus some more in this analysis today. Those posts got such a good response that I thought that I would devote an entire episode to this subject. That is the double think that has come to exist in the United States of America. And it has infiltrated, it started off culturally, but it has infiltrated into nearly every institution in our society. It is adopted by corporations, by schools, by individuals. And I want to explore what these are and what it reveals about the health of our society or lack thereof, if we can so easily succumb to this double think. Now, at the outset, I want to say a few disclaimers or things to get out of the way before we dive in. The first is, you may be thinking, well, you know, Julie, if you're doing a whole show on hypocrisy, hypocrisy has existed for as long as human beings have been around. And that is absolutely true. This is on both the right and on the left. For instance, there are people on the right who wax eloquent about the nuclear family and about remaining faithful to their wives, and then it comes out that they cheated on their wives and had a love child, okay? Yes, that is totally hypocritical. We also see, you know, on the left, people like John Kerry waxing eloquent about how climate change is the greatest existential threat to our existence as he rides around on private planes. That is absolutely true. Another example is that we hear people on the right talking all about democracy, and yet they support someone like Donald Trump, who is in who in his rhetoric is extremely anti-democratic, very disparaging of people who disagree with him. And also, many would argue that some of his actions have been anti-democratic. Then we have people on the left who talk all about democracy as well, and then they support someone like Joe Biden, who has literally made a career out of lying for his entire life, gets bribes from China, Ukraine, Romania, and Kazakhstan, etc. I happen to think, of course, that Joe Biden is a far worse offender as far as being anti-democratic than Donald Trump, but we'll leave that aside. The point of the episode is not to expose these kind of micro examples of hypocrisy, but to zoom out and point out contradictions in our worldview, because our worldview is really what matters more than the individual actions or statements or hypocrisy of everyday people. We in the United States as a citizenry need to agree, not on everything, but on a common set of values and worldview. And if we are succumbing to this, think this in some ways, but think that way in other ways, we're just going to become a disorganized, atrophied people, which is certainly not good. Now, before we get into these, I know it's kind of a, a lead up here, but but forgive me. I really do want to be consistent. Obviously, I am conservative. That is not a secret. But 
I want to be consistent and talk about some parts of Republican or conservatives worldviews that may be deemed hypocritical or contradictory or examples of doublethink. I have three that I have identified, and I'm sure that some of you watching may be able to identify some more, and I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. That was said kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I sincerely appreciate any time people write to me with, with any uh, source of information, as long as it is said kindly. One example is abortion. Conservatives think that abortion should not be allowed. In other words, that the government should be able to tell a woman what choice she should make with her body. But then when it comes to vaccines, conservatives, especially with the COVID vaccines, don't think that the government should tell someone what to do with their body. You know what? I'll admit that does seem a bit contradictory. Now, it's contradictory on the other side, but it's exactly flipped. Whereas when it comes to abortion, people on the left say my body, my choice. When it comes to vaccines, they say the opposite. So arguably, both sides are equally contradictory in that way. Now, to defend the conservative position for a moment, which is the one I am more inclined to agree with, when it comes to the COVID vaccine, the reason why conservatives were against those mandates is because the COVID vaccine was not widely developed and uh, thoroughly tested before it was rolled out. I mean, the boosters were tested on mice when they were rolled out. They weren't even tested on human beings. But then when it comes to abortion, there's another life that you have to consider there in addition to your own. We can put that aside, but again, trying to be consistent here and talk about how there are double think or contradictions in worldview on both sides of the aisle. Another example that people point to as far as right-wing double think is that conservatives are pro-life in the womb, but pro-death penalty when it comes to criminals. Again, I get that that's kind of contradictory. I honestly don't view that so much as double think as much as it is exercising judgment that someone who hasn't done anything wrong deserves the opportunity at life, which all of us who are living had the opportunity to enjoy because hello, we're living. But then when someone takes another life, they have committed the ultimate sin and they deserve to have their own life taken. I think that that is perfectly legitimate, but some think it's double think. And then the third example is special. Ending. That is absolutely a classic example of conservative doublethink. We're seeing that play out recently in the U.S. House of Representatives, where conservatives are supposed to conserve resources, right? And then we spend just as much in many cases as Democrats. Now to the bulk of the episode. Most of these examples that I am giving whether they are cultural examples or historic examples, do mostly come from the left. There is a reason for that. It is not just because I hate the left and I am constantly wanting to disparage and expose how terrible they are. It is because more of these examples of doublethink worldview exist on the left than on the right. Also, these examples are so common in our society because the left has a real stranglehold on our culture. That isn't even a partisan or controversial statement. If you disagree with me on that one, I don't really know what planet you're living on with all due respect. I mean, the uh, left-wing individuals make up universities by wild proportions. They make up the uh, writers in Hollywood, the actors in Hollywood. I mean, in schools, teachers unions, which are Democrat funded and supported, rule the roost. We see a lot of the gender and race theories that are being uh, promulgated in schools across the board or at the behest of left wingers. There are so many examples. So that is why there is a disproportionate number of left wing examples, because they have so effectively uh, exercise their influence in our institutions. The first one, apropos of my tweets, is that on the one hand, we are told in the United States to confront our history, to constantly educate ourselves and know about our ugly past. But then we see that there is a huge cultural and indeed governmental push to remove statues and other things which would remind us of that ugly past. Let's listen to a professor, Hassan Jeffries, at Ohio State University, talking about how, as Americans, we need to confront our history. It's hard history because it's difficult to imagine the kind of inhumanity that leads one to enslave children to make bricks for your comfort and convenience. It's hard history because 
it's hard to talk about the violence of slavery, the beatings, the whippings, the kidnappings, the forced family separations. It's hard history because it's hard to teach white supremacy, which is the ideology that justify slavery. And so rather than confront hard history, we tend to avoid it. Here is an example of us avoiding it. This is a clip from 2020 when a Confederate statue was being torn down in North Carolina. After the death of George Floyd in May of 2020, the Southern Poverty Law Center found that 157 memorials were removed in the United States. 73 Confederate monuments were removed or renamed in 2021. And this was not just a trend that was confined to the year after the George Floyd death. It is extended to this very day. For instance, right now, the New York City Council is considering a proposal by the Cultural Affairs Committee to remove even more statues and artwork that, quote, depict historical figures who owned enslaved persons or directly benefited economically from slavery or who participated in systemic crimes against indigenous peoples or other crimes against humanity. One of the statues that is being contested here or advocating um, to be removed is of George Washington. New York City in 2018 removed a statue of J. Marion Sims, who was an Alabama physician in the 1800s. He was called the father of gynecology. He terribly operated uh, experiments on female slaves without their consent. His statue was removed. And in January of 2022, the iconic bronze statue of President Theodore Roosevelt was removed from the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, costing the city two million dollars just to take that statue down. OK, let's acknowledge something that is totally fair. Most white people do not know what it is like to be a black person in America and what it is like to walk by a Confederate statue and see that statue of someone who was so egregiously evil against black people or their ancestors. I totally understand that. However, what I'm trying to do here is just point out this contradiction. And I don't see anybody else, A, recognizing the contradiction or B, challenging it. How is it the case that we are told to confront, confront, confront? As Hassan Jeffries said, people run away from the history of white supremacy. It's one of the hardest things to teach. We hear that all the time. When it, but how can we reconcile that with wanting to take away things that would teach us about white supremacy? I mean, when you live in a town and there is a Confederate statue, or if you're visiting a city in the United States, as I have, and you see a Confederate statue in the middle of you know the plaza that you're in, it is hugely educational. You go, what is that? Who is that? And you read about it and you go, oh my gosh, that is what this is. And you just get this sense of, oh my gosh, evil was right here. That is the best history lesson of white supremacy and of our ugly past that anyone could provide. Because when you take those statues and you put them in museums, it's going to be a teeny, teeny, tiny group of Americans who are going to want to spend the time and the energy and will even take the interest to travel and educate themselves about this. I've talked about this on Timeless before, but I really came to grips with my statue stance recently when I visited Berlin, Germany. There are all of these monuments throughout the city which deal with Germany's ugly past. For instance, there's a huge memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe in the center of Germany. There are these stumbling stones all across uh, Berlin. Or excuse me, I said in the middle of Germany, in the middle of Berlin. There are stumbling stones all across Berlin which have the name of the Jewish individual or family which lived in the building that you are standing in front of, the date that they went to the concentration camp, and the date that they were killed. That is very powerful. Now, some, of course, would argue, well, wait a minute. Those are memorials or plaques that commemorate the victims of the atrocities. Those are memorials that celebrate the perpetrators of the atrocities as a Confederate statue does. It celebrates the, the white supremacist, the, the slave owner. Totally understood. Well, you know another 
big, big monument that was in the center of Berlin, the Soviet Memorial. I mean, when I talk about big monument, I mean, this is like huge, the, this, this memorial that was created by the Soviets in 1945. Now, the Soviet Union does deserve credit for toppling Nazi Germany. It was the Soviets who came into Berlin, not the Americans, not the French, the Soviets who came into Berlin in 1945 and toppled Hitler's government in the decisive Battle of Berlin, ending World War II. They deserve credit for that. However, the Soviets did terrible things during World War II, especially to the German population. There were thousands of Soviet men, soldiers, who raped German women routinely every day. Also, the Soviet government set up their own government in East Germany and in East Berlin, and there were routine atrocities against the subjected population. They were denied freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. If you said one thing that was even remotely critical of the government, you would be imprisoned, sometimes even tortured. And yet the Soviets are memorialized in that city. And I can imagine that it is very triggering. And I don't say that that tongue in cheek. I really mean it. I I can imagine it is triggering for some people to walk by that monument and remember, because there are so many people today who lived during the time of a partition Germany, and they remember all that they had to endure. But there's a reason why Berlin keeps that up. Even though the city and the country is very anti-Soviet, it's because they don't want their population to forget about their history, the good parts and the ugly parts. I think we ought to adopt a similar thing here in the United States. And quickly, you know, this is where I really get a sense that some of the people who are advocating for tearing down statues or removing names aren't really so consistent in their motivation. Because you know the first thing that you would do if you wanted to stop celebrating and memorializing a white supremacist? You would rename Yale University. Or you would rename Columbia University. They hate Christopher Columbus. White supremacist, horrible person. I don't think that Christopher Columbus was, but you take my point. They don't want to rename Columbia University because people who go to Columbia want to brag that they went to Columbia. They don't want to lose the prestige that comes with saying that they went to that school. Yale, the guy, I think his name is like Elihu Yale, um, weird name, E-L-I-H-U. He was a slave owner. He was, uh, actually, excuse me, he was, he oversaw the slave trade. And there is actually, there was a painting of him in one of Yale's museums that showed him with a young slave. But people who go to prestigious schools don't want to take away that name. So they do it selectively uh, when it doesn't take away from any kind of glory that they could get. Just thought I would add that in there. That's number one. Confront the history, but tear down things which would remind us of it. Example number two of doublethink is this obsession with diversity and then how it plays out in practice. We hear schools, corporations, individuals in power talk all the time about how much they value diversity and they want to promulgate it in their institutions. But then you look at those institutions and in many ways they are not diverse at all. The most obvious example is the lack of conservatives, both students and faculty, at most American universities. You look at Harvard, according to a recent survey, less than 1.5% of the faculty identify as conservative. Around 4% of the student body, including yours truly, voted that they identify as conservative. That is a dismal number for a institution that claims to be very um, interested in the free exchange of thought. Now, I'm not just trying to pick on my alma mater. This is true of virtually any college or university in the country. We also see that these colleges and universities, not all of them, but many of them, allow conservative speakers to be uh, shouted down and even uh, carted away and not allowed to speak. Michael Knowles faced huge protests at Purdue, Purdue. Ben Shapiro at Berkeley, literally at Berkeley, there were like it was a war zone. You need to Google it, a war zone when Ben Shapiro spoke. Dennis Prager and Charlie Kirk at Arizona State University, a faculty member was fired for supporting those individuals to come to speak. Candace Owens at Rutgers, Matt Walsh at the University of Iowa, you get the point. Another thing though, another example, uh, alongside the classic, they hate conservatives example, 
is the existence of affinity groups. I should amend that statement, not just the existence, but the proliferation of affinity groups. At Columbia University, a name that will not be changed, they have over 50 cultural and identity-based student organizations. The Kessler Foundation found that this was also prevalent in most corporations, that almost half of large companies offer affinity groups. And at one particularly prominent bank, Citigroup, 22% of employees participate in such affinity groups. There were similar numbers for JP Morgan. Anecdotally, I remember at my graduation, walking through the yard and seeing all of these people with their, uh, not tassels, I always don't know the word, but they're like pieces of cloth that they would wear in addition to their regalia. And a lot of these pieces of cloth would say things like FGLI, which meant first generation low income. And then you'd see another one that said AAPI, signifying that the person wearing it was a member of the Asian American Pacific Islander group or Black Student Association, or LGBTQIA+. And I remember it so hit me at my graduation that it seemed like I was at a mock trial of an assembly at the United Nations where everyone was like carrying their flags, representing their respective countries. These schools and corporations in large part have fractured and segmented people into acronyms into these groups where they flock to, to be around people who are incredibly similar to them. That's the irony. For these places talking all about how much they care about diversity, they encourage people to go into these groups with those who are of their same race or uh, cultural background. The whole point is, of diversity is to be around people who aren't like you. Now, on principle, I don't oppose the existence of these groups. I think it started off as a good thing for people to be able to seek comfort and solidarity and companionship with people who are similar. But the problem is it has so ballooned into these these affinity groups becoming extremely mainstream and common that a lot of the times people spend a large amount of time in those affinity groups and really don't cross over and try to encounter people who are different from them. It's the classic Machiavelli insight, which I love, that a virtue taken too far ceases to be a virtue. He talks about that with generosity. If you're too generous, you actually allow uh, cruelty. If you're too merciful with people, then you give people too many passes and then you allow them to become cruel. It's an exact subversion of what you are trying to promulgate. It's the same thing with these affinity groups. It started off as a good thing, wanting to help people in some ways promote diversity. And now they've gotten so big and mainstream that it actually undermines diversity. Number three, the carceral state. We often hear people talking about how terrible the United States carceral state, the prison system is. But then we see a different thing in practice. The Washington Post editorialist, Zach Klein, who is a city attorney and prosecutor in Columbus, Ohio, wrote an op-ed called Nonviolent Offenders Need Help, Not Jail. And there's a large percentage of Americans who believe that nonviolent offenders should not be in prison. Time Magazine published an article in which they boldly claimed that 25% of prisoners that's 364,000 people, almost all nonviolent low-level offenders would be better served by alternatives to incarceration, such as treatment, community service, or probation, okay? So we hear this a lot. Nonviolent offenders need help, not incarceration. But then let's look at what happened to nonviolent January Sixers. Enrique Terrio, who is the head of the Proud Boys group, which, you know, I still don't even really know what that is. Apparently, Proud Boys and QAnon are so common on the right wing. I, I really, I mean, I was never heard of QAnon before they started talking about it, let alone the Proud Boys. He's the head of the Proud Boys group. He wasn't even in D.C., let alone at the United States Capitol on January 6th, and he's facing 22 years in prison. Jacob Chansley, the QAnon shaman, was serving a 41-month sentence, though he was nonviolent, and a video actually came out that he was being escorted through the Capitol by nine different Capitol police officers, and he was taken out of prison 
because it was proven that he was let into and taken around the Capitol by police and that he was not engaging in violence. John Strand, who is Dr. Simone Gold's partner, has made the news for uh, his, his, excuse me, ties to her, is serving two years and eight months in prison for walking into the Capitol with a bullhorn, just standing in the Capitol. That is not to excuse any of those individuals' actions, even if they were nonviolent. You shouldn't breach the Capitol. Stupid and wrong. But we hear that with some prisoners, nonviolent offenders deserve one kind of treatment. But then it, when it's with conservatives or people on January 6th or people with whom the left disagrees, if they're nonviolent, then they deserve 22 years if they're Enrique Terrio. Now, some may say that I'm cherry picking by using those examples, but there is a theme here that some people are treated differently because of their political affiliation than others. And if you really on principle believe that fundamentally the carceral system is defective at treating nonviolent individuals, then you would extend that equally to everyone. And you would think that someone like Enrique Terrio, instead of needing incarceration, needed treatment. But clearly they don't. Double think example number four. This is a historic example, but it continues to the present day. Science matters, but science can be selectively enforced. We saw this in 2020 during the lockdowns. How dare you go outside and join in a group? You're spreading COVID. You're super spreaders. You're putting people at risk. Those people who are protesting lockdowns and gathering together with their signs, they are keeping COVID alive and well and killing people. But then when people came together, large swaths of people, not just like a high school reunion size, came together to protest after the whole George Floyd death and during the Black Lives Matter summer, that wasn't a super spreader event. That was totally fine. Let's look at Canada's news media and the way they dealt with this differently. This first clip is the, uh, a media group in Canada denouncing anti-lockdown protests as putting people in danger. We, we have healthcare workers down the street at these hospitals working around the clock to protect the community. 99.9% .9 of the people in this province are working together side by side. That's the reason we were able to see a flattening of the curve. But then Look how small that is. We, we have you know a bunch of yahoos out in the front of Queen's Park sitting there protesting 20. that the place isn't open as they're breaking the law and putting everyone in jeopardy, putting themselves in jeopardy, putting the, the workers in jeopardy, and God forbid one of them end up in the hospital down the street. And here's a Canada media outlet talking about Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter protesters during COVID. Let's hear how the they deal with them. The tracks every single case, and so far not one has been linked to those recent protests. So why is that? Well, the credit goes to a combination of things, <laughs> according to the provincial health officer. They were outside for short periods of time, for one, and most kept their distance and wore a mask. Uh, the other people were outside. They kept their distance, and there was like 10 of them as opposed to looks like hundreds in that clip. Holy moly. I mean, we're seeing this today with uh, the continuation of science being kind of selectively used. You have to follow the science in some ways. You know, the science would say that you shouldn't allow people who are young and their brains not yet being fully formed to make consequence consequential decisions about their body pertaining to gender affirming care. But we can just throw out the science when it selectively benefits a certain political group's uh, uh, desires. Example of double think number five. Oh my gosh, this is such a big one. The way that black people's murders are dealt with in this country. When it is a white perpetrator, it is the biggest atrocity and deal in the world. When it is a black perpetrator, who cares? Yawns. That is not a Black Lives Matter position. If you believe Black Lives Matter, you should be incensed when a white person kills a black person and you should be incensed when a black person kills a black person. And black on black crime is far more prevalent and far more of a problem than white on black crime, but no one talks about it. And if you do talk about it, you're a terrible racist bigot. 
That is not Black Lives Matter. That is not caring about black lives. That is only caring about black lives when the perpetrator is of a race that you can use it to benefit yourself politically as a talking point. According to the United States Department of Justice, quote, homicide is the leading leading cause of death among young black men and contribute significantly to the shortened lifespan of the black male. In about 80 to 90% of cases, the black victim was killed by another black, okay? 8,400 black murder victims in 2021 was, was, uh, existed in the United States, okay? 11 of them were unarmed blacks who were killed by police. But those are the ones that get the most attention. Again, zooming out, this is a fundamental defect in a worldview. And it is a really bad sign when a country only selectively freaks out about certain individuals' deaths. That does not indicate that the country has their priorities and their worldview straight. And it is actually offensive to the many black victims who die at the hands of other blacks because their deaths are not viewed as something that we should care about. Double think number six, classic. Amplify, believe, and protect women. But there's no such thing as a woman. Let's listen to an associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson, during her confirmation hearing, not knowing how to answer a basic question about womanhood. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N- not in okay. this context. So I'm you not a biologist. The of the wor- okay, I know this one is played so much, but can we just pause for a minute and really internalize the absurdity that we now live in a country where people cannot say what a woman is? It's so easy for someone like Kadonji Brown Jackson and for someone like me. Just, just look down. It's us. Here we are. We're women. Now let's listen to the president of the National Women's Law Center, who also can't define a woman. Earlier this year, our newest Supreme Court Justice, uh, Katandra Brown Jackson, was asked what a woman is, and she had a difficult time defining that. Since you are the president of the National Women's Law Center, I was hoping that you could define what a woman is for us in this committee hearing. Well, as the president of the National Women's Law Center, you can imagine I say woman a lot uh, in my day job. Okay, so I'm just asking for the definition. so, and, and so what I'll tell you is I am a woman. That's how I identify. Okay. But I wonder, however, if in part the reason that you're asking a question is that you're trying to suggest that people who I am don't simply asking the question and I simply want an answer. I, and so I, I think it's actually really important to be very clear here that there are people who identify as non-binary. I think okay. about All 5% right. we're, we're, of young we're people We're not going to go there. I was hoping maybe you would, I was hoping that you, maybe you would say something that maybe we learned in um, high school biology. <laughs> By the way, male patriarchy is so common in mainstream, but it's not patriarchal at all to let certain men say that they are women and then take women's jobs and women's trophies. That doesn't ring at all as patriarchy to me. This is a fundamental defective worldview. When you are over the age of 18, I really want to make this position clear lest I be called lest I be called a transphobe. When you're over the age of 18, you can do whatever you want. If you want to get surgeries, if you want to do hormones, if you want to change your name, change your pronouns, you are an adult. It's a free country. Have at it. But that does not change the basic reality that there are men and there are women and there are only two genders. Okay, so amplify, believe, protect women, but there's no such thing as a woman. Here's another one, number seven. Amplify, believe, protect minority voices unless they politically disagree with you. Then they're fake minorities. They're self-hating minorities. They're traitors to their minority status. That is so racist. Let's listen to Michael Eric Dyson, who is an author, minister, and radio host, calling Clarence Thomas self-hating because Justice Thomas voted against keeping affirmative action in college admissions. Yeah, that is a shameful manifestation of a lethal and malignant black self-hatred. Yeah. Star Trek actor George, my producers will know this, Takei, T-A-K-E-I? That's what I said, Takai. 
I don't watch Star Trek. Forgive me. Uh, this dude famously fumed that that Clarence Thomas was, quote, a clown in blackface in 2015. Uh, that's pretty racist. Representative Benny Thompson from Mississippi called Clarence Thomas an Uncle Tom. A L.A. Times editorial writer called Larry Elder the blackface of white supremacy. Joe Biden said that any black person who votes for Trump, quote, ain't black. And Caitlyn Jenner has been called a fraud and a fake transgender person because she opposes transgender women competing in women's sports. Again, is a society really that great and noble and democratic and tolerant when they will so vilify a minority and, it, and attack that minority's minority status if that minority deigns to disagree with the orthodoxy? You decide. Number eight, kids are too fragile to hear conservative speakers. It's triggering. It's terrible. Don't bring them to campuses. Don't subject them to that trauma. But they are not too fragile to decide at age 12, 13, 14 to have their breasts cut off. Here is a testimony from a detransitioner, Chloe Cole, who so powerfully urges us to change this double think. The gender specialist I was taken to, taken to see told my parents that I need to be put on puberty blocking drugs right away. They asked my parents a simple question. Would you rather have a dead daughter or a living transgender son? The choice was enough for my parents to let their guard down. And in retrospect, I can't blame them. This is the moment that we all became victims of so-called gender affirming care. I was fast tracked onto puberty blockers and then testosterone. The resulting menopausal like hot flashes made focusing on school impossible. I still get joint pains and weird pops in my back, but they were far worse when I was on the blockers. A month later, when I was 13, I had my first testosterone injection. It's caused permanent changes to my body. My voice will forever be deeper, my jawline sharper, my nose longer, my bone structure permanently masculinized, my Adam's apple more prominent, my fertility unknown. I look in the mirror sometimes and I feel like a monster. I had a double mastectomy at 15. They tested my amputated breast for cancer. And I was cancer free, of course. I was perfectly healthy. There was nothing wrong with my still developing body or my breasts, other than that as an insecure teenage girl, I felt awkward about it. After my breasts were taken away from me, the tissue was incinerated. Before I was able to legally drive, I had, part, I had a huge part of my future womanhood taken from me. Mm. I will never be able to breastfeed. I struggle to look at myself in the mirror at times. I, w I, still, I still struggle to this day with sexual dysfunction. And I have massive scars across my chest. And the skin grafts that they use, that they took of my nipples, are weeping fluid today. And they were grafted into a more masculine positioning, they said. After surgery, my grades in school plummeted. Everything that I went through did nothing to address my underlying mental health issues that I had. My childhood was ruined along with thousands of detransitioners that I know through our networks. This needs to stop. You alone can stop it. Enough children have already been victimized by this barbaric pseudoscience. You know, another thing is that 18 year olds, adults, shouldn't have to incur the responsibility of paying off their student loans, but people as young as Chloe Cole at age 11 to, could incur the responsibility of being able to decide their own genders. Before we continue with the final examples of doublethink and then some th general thoughts, I want to quickly tell you about my pillow. I use many my pillow products. I walk into work wearing my slippers because they are so comfortable. I use my towels. I sleep on the my pillow in the Giza Dream bed sheets, and you can too, and get them at a discount with the promo code Hartman, spelled H-A-R-T-M-A-N. For a limited time, you'll get 60% off of the Giza Dream sheets that comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. You'll get a set for as low as $39.99 with the promo code Hartman. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square or call 1-800-566-6745 and use the promo code Hartman. Example of double think number nine. You see, these are very diverse examples pertaining to a lot of different things. Number nine, Fossil fuel waste is bad. Drilling for fossil fuels is bad. But electric vehicle battery waste, who cares? 
Drilling for electric vehicle battery parts is good. How does that make any sense? It doesn't. Welcome to the modern world. President Biden says no more drilling, no more drilling, period. But then we entreat to other countries to drill, such as China in the Congo, to get lithium and copper and cobalt and other rare earth minerals to fund uh, or to uh, serve in our electric vehicles. And, you know, we talk about how slavery is horrible and defective and how dare we did it centuries ago and we should self-flagellate ourselves every day for the fact that we did it centuries ago but then we allow it to happen now by entreating to these countries to get the minerals which we could get here and they use slave trade in order to get those minerals hello people wake up this is a crazy world a very contradictory world if we are against slavery as we should be we should be ashamed that we did it we should not be entreating to these countries which allow it to happen for our purposes. Another example is, you know, we're so anti-homophobia and we're so ashamed that once in America, gay people were not treated very well. And you know what? We should be. But then we entreat to countries in Africa and half of Africa's 54 countries criminalize homosexuality. In some countries, they penalize it with the death penalty. That is true of the Middle East. Where are our principles? Number 10, America is systemically racist, but non-white immigrants should totally come here. We should throw open the borders, allow everyone in. And how dare you say that we shouldn't? If America is a defective, evil, bigoted, systemically racist place, why should we be encouraging non-white immigrants to come here to be subjected to that racism? Number 11. <laughs> this one's a great one. Democrats favor labor, right? They talk about they're, they are the party of the everyday person, the party of labor. But then they allow undocumented immigrants to come here. You know, Cesar Chavez, a hero of the left, and RFK, a hero of the left, they were against illegal immigration precisely for the reason that they were pro-labor. And they knew that allowing illegal immigration would mean that a lot of people would come here and work for a very small salary, and that would make it such that American laborers would not have the same opportunities, okay? I have so much sympathy for people who want to come into this country fleeing persecution. This is not what this is about. What this is about is exposing the contradictions in favoring labor, but then enacting ways that are against it. Number 12, we have a few more. We need to be sensitive in some ways, right? Especially with our language. We should call the homeless unhoused. If you don't call them unhoused, you are an insensitive bigot. Be sensitive, right? But then we can let the unhoused live in squalor, sleep on the sidewalk, needles all around them, no food, no water, no clothes, no health care. But who cares, right? Because we called them unhoused. We're sensitive. Number 13, democracy matters so much. Oh my gosh, the will of the people, by the people, for the people. People should be able to decide. But then we have these fourth heads of government, these agencies like the CDC, the EPA making decisions about us during COVID, the lockdowns, EPA really is behind all of these uh, uh, banning gas-powered vehicles, uh, uh, things that are coming into fruition. We have reparations and culture committees, which are unelected, but get to decide if we have to pay reparations or if we tear down statue. That's totally in accordance with democracy, right? Number 14, again, democracy, democracy, democracy. But let's silence people and deplatform people who don't agree with us on social media. That is a directive by the federal government. The Biden administration is facing litigation and is under investigation for pressuring certain social media companies to control the narrative and censor people who disagreed. And finally, the last one, folks, and believe it or not, I actually shortened this list. I could name so many more, but these are, I think, are the most common. Criminals, this is speaking of social media, criminals should not be defined by their crime. But if you made one stupid comment on Twitter 10 years ago, you should be defined by that moment. What? But welcome to the modern world. In closing, this is not just hypocrisy. If you look at a hypocrite, 
a hypocrite talks about all of the things that they want to do and then don't fully live up to it. I'm a hypocrite with regard to my fitness. I talk a lot about, well, I'm going to work out this week. I'm going to go to Barry's boot camp, you know, four times and I don't do it. Maybe I'll go once and then I'll, you know, eat half a bag of chocolate covered pretzels as I did last night. Yeah, I'm a hypocrite, but you know what? What hypocrites do is that they actually want to live up to what they are talking about. And they have some shame, not all hypocrites, but a lot of hypocrites have some shame that they haven't fully lived up to what they are talking about. That is different from what we are seeing now, which is in many cases, fraudulence. Fraudulence is when someone doesn't actually believe what they claim to believe. And they don't care about living up to what they say. They wag the finger at you to do what they claim they care about, but they themselves don't do it at all. We see this with Pete Buttigieg. You know, we, I mean, really it's amazing that he is not more called out for this thing that he does in Washington, D.C. He may have stopped it, but there were a few weeks when he was showing up to work and he would say, because he's the transportation secretary, that he would bike to work in order to avoid going in vehicles which guzzle gas and emit carbon. You know what he actually did? He went in an SUV. His driver drove him to like three blocks away from his office. He would get out, get on the bicycle and bike the remaining three blocks to his office so that the media would take photos of him and go, oh, look at Pete Buttigieg being so great. That is the kind of culture we live in now, where as long as people can get away with it, they don't care. And we, the people, knowing that it's hypocrisy and fraudulence, don't care at all. That is a culture that is severely ill. What really made the Soviet Union collapse was in addition to it just not working. For instance, the economic policies were a total disaster. In addition to the Soviet Union just not working, what really made it collapse was that the people knew it was a fraud. They knew that everything was a lie. They knew that the system was defective. When people stop believing in a system, you have a lot of trouble. And increasingly, there are people, myself included, who are not believing in this system because we see people talking so much about some things and then behaving in ways that are totally different and we just cannot sustain a civilization based on all of these examples of double think thanks so much for joining me if you have more examples comment them down below a great thing when i posted on twitter and instagram a lot of you wrote more examples and boy there are a lot so please do stay engaged i love hearing from you and a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below Thanks, everyone. I'll see you soon. <laughs>